It is 1830, and for 18 years, steamboats have churned the waters of the Mississippi River, downstream with valley produce, upstream with manufactured goods as black smoke billows and whistles blow. Traveling aboard the boats are northerners like John Abbott, southern planters like Alcée Dornier, who knows the river well here on the lower delta, not far above New Orleans. Yes, you'll find our New Orleans different from your cities up north. We Creoles are different, too. Most of us, you know, still speak only French. Take my own family. Tu sais, Jacques, le premier bateau à vapeur a descendu le fleuve la même année de ta naissance. Et moi, maman, je suis née l'année de la bataille de la Nouvelle-Orléans. Maman, maman, nous sommes tous invités à la place à l'âle. Très bien. Allons-y. And now, a visit to the pilot house. What are your Louisiana plantations like, Mr. Dornier? Well, now, mine is a cotton plantation. The house is of a style very common in these parts, with the living quarters well above ground for protection against floods. Back from the house and gardens are the plantation fields. The cotton season is about over for this year, and just now, the slaves are picking the few remaining bowls that have been the last to ripen. Of course, most of our land is planted in cane. My friend Jean Thibault has a cane plantation just around this next bend. His home stands at the end of a long lane of oak trees, making a very beautiful setting. You must be sure to see it while you are here. The house and grounds would delight you, I'm sure. This is the busy season at Thibault's, where the cane harvest is just beginning, and the crop this year is one of the best I have ever seen. It will take from now until Christmas to cut it all. Our land in these parts is ideally suited to the raising of sugar cane, you know, and I assure you that sugar can sweeten life in more ways than one. Well. I've been telling you only about the country. But tomorrow, you will see the city for yourself. The shore passes, and the steamboat with its passengers and cargo proceeds down the river toward New Orleans. The next day, as the hour of the family's arrival draws near, the Dornier townhouse in the French quarter of the city is the scene of busy activity on the part of the household servants. The flagstones of the inner courtyard are given a thorough cleaning. Pitchers of water filled at the cistern are placed in readiness in the bedrooms. And in the kitchen, preparations go forward for the proper reception of the Dorniers. Preparations ever a source of pride to the family's skillful cook. And now, with their trip completed, the Dorniers call at the cathedral. Here, Jacques takes his leave and proceeds to the townhouse to make sure that all is ready. Meanwhile, the other members of the family kneel reverently before the cathedral altar. Religious observances are a highly important aspect of life to devout Creoles like the Dorniers. Presently, all are seated in the courtyard of their home to enjoy a welcoming cup of coffee. C'est bon de vous avoir dans notre ville encore, madame. C'est bon d'être de retour. Thus, with the serving of coffee in the courtyard, the town life of the Dorniers is ushered in for another winter season. And it is a life of varied activities. For Marie, there is daily practice on the harp. For the Creole young lady is expected to be accomplished For the younger children, Raoul and Jeanette, there are regular lessons in English under the guidance of a governess who is responsible for their schooling. Will you read first, Raoul? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men 
are created equal, but they are endowed by their creator with certain unamiable rights. But in contrast to home life is another activity out under the dueling oaks, a little distance from town. The code duello is still the practice for settling disputes between gentlemen. Here, as seconds to the contestants, we find young Jacques Dornier, together with his cousin Pierre, just back from study in Paris. Also intent on the flashing sabers is the ever-essential surgeon. And regulating the entire procedure, there is the director in charge. A contestant may be disarmed, but the duel will continue until blood is drawn and honor is avenged. Later in the day, we find a crowd gathered at the slave market, where, with their physiques exposed to view, slaves await their turn upon the auction block before the assembled planters. Messieurs, 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 voici un jeune homme en bonne santé, fort robuste, excellent travailleur, un charpentier. And now a bid from Platter Dornier. Quatre cent piastres. Four hundred dollars. Cinq cent piastres. Five hundred dollars. Six cent piastres. Six hundred dollars. With the auction over, Platter Dornier and the auctioneer proceed to the Cabildo or City Hall on business. Meanwhile, in one of the local cemeteries, where the low land necessitates burial above ground, Madame Dornier and the younger children place a wreath on the tomb of a relative, one of the many victims of a recent yellow fever epidemic. In the evening, the Dorniers entertain at dinner their friend of the boat trip, Mr. Abbott. Good food and lavish entertainment are points of pride with Creole planter and household servant alike. Nor are their attentions lost upon their guests. You Creoles live the good life, Mr. Dornier. Thank you, sir. We try to. It seems strange in a way. We call ourselves Creole, and we call you people Americans. But I think the distinction will mean less as the years go by. Of course, all of us, French, Spanish, English, German, Dutch, people of the North, people of the South, we all fled the oppressions of Europe out of a love of freedom. That will endure. That will bring us closer. But now, Marie and Jacques excuse themselves from the table to prepare for a party the evening holds in store. In Marie's room, with its canopied four-poster bed, a devoted maid is all attention in her concern that Mademoiselle Marie shall look her prettiest for the evening's festivities. Already, Marie's young beau is making his call at the entrance to the Dornier home, the door illumined by the light of an oil-burning street lamp. Close by, a servant stands ready with a lantern to guide the party on their way. A chaperon escorting Marie, the young beau following, as the group make their way along the dimly lighted street. Meanwhile, in the Dornier drawing room... They're saying up north that the railroads may be harmful to New Orleans. Yes, I know, but I disagree. We will continue to prosper. We have an abundance of fertile soil, an excellent climate, and an ample supply of slave labor to handle our cotton and cane plantations. Besides our agricultural wealth, we have the river with its shipping that increases year by year. And above all, we have our location at the entrance to the entire Mississippi Valley. Yes, the New Orleans of 1830 looks to the future with calm. There is the river, there are ships, and there is an ever-increasing flow of commerce along the main waterway of a rapidly growing nation.